Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Cara tonight. And our topic is how to conquer evil. Should be easy, right? How to conquer evil. We're looking at a biblical story that I think shows kind of a picture of what we do, what the Lord does, what our attitude has to be, and all that. And so that's going to be good fun. It's that story that you may be familiar with where Moses, uh, as long as he has his hands in the air, they're winning. But if, if his hands go down, they're not. And I think if we look at the details of this, we can see something about how to conquer evil. So if that happens to be a problem in your life, dear friends, maybe this would be of interest to you and value. So please do join us. Let's open with a prayer. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the Word made flesh. We pray for your presence among us. Show us yourself, your heart, your mind in the pages of your Word, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity. Amen. Amen. So great to be with you, sending love to those of you out there online and getting the audio and up in Canada and all you beautiful people here in the room. And um, so, yes, how to conquer evil. Uh, Swedenborg says kind of two different things about this. Uh, one is a little depressing. It's that you can't thoroughly conquer even a single evil ever to all eternity. So that might rain a little on our parade tonight. Um, that's one statement he makes, but what I think he means by that is that once something is sort of imprinted on your soul, it stays there, but it doesn't mean it has to be active. The Lord ha knows how to deal with these things. He talks about moving them to the side and they hang down, whatever that means. And, they become inactive. They're no longer central. They don't rule your life. And in other passages, he talks about conquering and that these things can be conquered. And once they're conquered in this world, they're permanently dealt with. And so we'll stick with that second set of passages and uh, look at this situation tonight in the story and see what's going on here. Uh, let's dig right into this, shall we? Let's go to the book of Exodus in the Old Testament chapter, well, I want to start us back at um, around chapter 15 um, in the Exodus story, which we talk about a lot in this Bible study. Um, uh, the children of Israel get out of Egypt. They finally escape. You know, Pharaoh actually drives them out, then regrets it, comes after them. But then Pharaoh and all his soldiers are destroyed in the sea and they escape and they're singing on the other shore and so on. And things are really, really great. They're singing and dancing. And then in 15, verse 23, uh, and an interesting little point, 1522, I actually want to start at, uh, all the time that they were talking to Pharaoh, they were always saying, uh, Moses said, let my people go three days into the wilderness so we can sacrifice to our, our God. So what actually happened three days? Does the Bible say what happened three days into their journey? Because they'd made all this noise about three days into our journey, we're going to sacrifice to our God. So look at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness. Just what they'd always been asking to do, three days into the wilderness. And what happened? And found no water. Oh. Now, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. So, instead of any sacrifice to the Lord, they all complained bitterly about this bitter water. And uh, so, Moses solves that problem. And then in chapter 16, they go on, and the children of Israel are very unhappy in 16, verse 3. They fear that, you know, they, they wish that they had all died in the land of Egypt because that would have been way better than being killed with hunger. So they went through thirst, and then they went through hunger. And then, let's see, in chapter 17 at the beginning, uh, what is the first verse there? Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey 
from the wilderness of Sim, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Uh-oh. So they got thirsty, then they got hungry, then they got thirsty again, and this is when Moses strikes the rock the first time, and the water comes out, and the people were very upset. They were practically ready to stone Moses before he did that. And uh, so I just wanted to set it up a little bit. Thirsty, hungry, thirsty, and then this is the fourth problem they have. And there's still been no sacrifice to the Lord yet. And uh, look at verse 8. Let's read from 8 through about the rest of the chapter there in Exodus 17. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Okay, so what we're going to be reading about is a fight with Amalek. Amalek is also sometimes referred to as the Amalekites. Amalek was a person. Uh, we'll read a little more about him in a bit. So the Amalekites or Amalek came and fought with Israel right there where they also had the water problem in Rephidim. Rephidim is a Hebrew word meaning resting place. Uh, so what do they do? Here's the story. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So rather strange situation. So M Moses and Joshua, Moses says to Joshua, you go choose some people. You go fight the Amalekites. I'm going to go up to the top of the hill here with the rod of God in my hand. We're starting to set up this little picture of how, how you deal with evil. Okay, go on. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It's a little bit curious to me. We've had a long introduction to Aaron. We've been introduced to Moses in the story. This is the first time Hur is ever mentioned. Only comes up once, uh, one other time in scripture. And uh, so all of a sudden there's this person, Hur, who goes up there with him. So there's three people on the top of the hill and every, you know, all the other fighting you know, the soldiers down in the valley. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now, this is a very weird little thing, isn't it? That he's got his rod of God in his hand. And while it's up, the Israelites are winning. And while it's down, the Amalekites are winning. Uh, very strange. Okay, go on. Does somebody want to answer the doorbell? Yes, that Thank would be you. kind. Thank you. Um, so, 12, but, verse 12. but Moses' hands became heavy. Uh oh. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Ah, so it seems like up until this point he's been standing there, holding it up, you know, and, and lowering it, raising it, and as long as, but it's hard to hold your hand up all day. Uh, you get, get very tired. So they put a stone and they sat him down on the stone. Okay, here you go. Sit down on this stone. That's an important detail. Go on. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Okay, so they supported him. And uh, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And then verse 13. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Yes, uh, in the grand language of the old King James, uh, which is just called the King James, Joshua discomfited Amalek. I imagine it's, you know, it's even worse than it sounds, but uh, <laughs> with the edge of the sword, uh, go on. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book. This is an interesting little detail of write this, write what happened in a book. Something happened here, write it in a book. And recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Now, I don't know if it's clear in the story yet that Joshua is going to be the, um, going to take over for Moses at some point. But uh, the Lord says to Moses, write this in a book for Joshua and, and read it to him, uh, that the Lord is going to utterly wipe out Amalek from under heaven, conquering the Amalekites. Go on. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. Uh-huh. For he said, 
because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Oh, now that's interesting because in verse 14, I'll utterly, you know, put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, which sounds like I'm just going to deal with it. It'll be gone. But then uh, in verse 16, the Lord is going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Oh, this is not... It's not going to be a one-day battle. It's not going to be a quick deal. Uh, this is this is going to be a long battle that goes on between the Israelites and the Amalekites. Okay, so that's our crucial story there. To just go over those images once again, you have Moses at the top of the hill, and he's got the rod of God in his hand, and he gets tired. and And when his hands are up, the Israelites win. When they're down, the Amalekites win. And so he, he finally his hands get heavy, he can't keep going. And so they bring him a stone, he sits on the stone, and Aaron comes on one side and Hur comes on the other, and they steady his hands so he's able to hold up his hands all day. And therefore Joshua, who's picked out some warriors and is fighting the Amalekites down in the valley, they win. And so I'm arguing tonight that this is a picture of how we fight against evil and what sort of clues do we get about how we fight against evil and, and how that whole war goes. Okay, let's get a little context here. Let's turn to the left and go to Genesis, first book of the Bible, to Genesis 36. Um, now, it's very tempting to ask our dear reader to read many of these wonderful proper mm -hmm. names in this chapter. There's a huge amount of genealogy in here. Oh, they look delicious. But it's essentially, verse, what do we have in verse 1? Now, this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Okay, now Esau, uh, you, you may remember Esau was the twin brother of Jacob. Jacob was the one who cheated Esau out of his birthright, or it just seemed like he finagled it somehow. Uh, and there was even some question of which one was sort of born for, you know, uh, all that sort of thing. So this is Esau. So the children of Israel, Israel is Jacob. I know this all sounds confusing, but uh, so the children of Israel, this was over 400 years later, but the children of Israel were the tribes that descended from the 12 sons of Israel, who was Jacob. So now we're talking about Jacob's brother Esau. Okay, and Esau has a, f a few different wives that it talks about there. And then um, look at verse 10. These were the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau, and Ruel, the son of Basemoth, the wife of Esau. Ah, I see. Okay, so he has a, a couple Ruel. of wives. And Eliphaz is the son of Ada, and Rule is the son of Basimath, okay? Uh, and the sons of Elif Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gautam, and Kenaz. Very nice. Okay. Mm. So you've got Esau, then you've got the next, and I'll tell you why this is important in a second. Doesn't matter if you can't remember, but there's Esau. His firstborn son is Eliphaz. And now those are Eliphaz's son. And then look at this little detail in, chapter, in verse 12 there. Now Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Okay, so uh, Eliphaz had a couple of wives, did he not? Oh, no, I guess it's Esau who has a couple of wives. But uh, Eliphaz has a wife who's not named, and he has five sons by her. But then he also has a concubine named Timnah, and that concubine is the mother of Amalek. The point being that Amalek were like first or second cousins to the children of Israel. They, they were kin folk. You know, now we've descended many, many generations through those 430 years, but they were, they were kinfolk. They had a common ancestor, you know, back in, in Isaac and everything. They come from the same line. So that's, that's, that's significant, I think, in ways that I hope to demonstrate 
And uh, then let's, let's just read some other passages relevant to this and sort of load them into your mind. Uh, if you will, good friends, let's turn to the right, go to Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter 24. And there's a story where Moses gets to Mount Sinai. And it's all about the Ten Commandments and so on. And let's start at verse 12 in Exodus 24 and read down to uh, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant, Joshua. Ah, Josh, there's Joshua again. So we had Moses and Joshua in that other story seven chapters ago. And now you have Moses and Joshua again. They're going up the mountain, okay? And Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come, until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Okay, so here we've got Moses, Joshua, Aaron, and Hur, same players yeah. as the other story. And Moses and Joshua are going to go up the mountain. Now, last time Moses and Joshua split up, and Moses was on the hill, and Joshua was down in the valley. This time Moses and Joshua are both going up, and Aaron and Hur are both staying down. And I mainly read this because this is the only other story in which Hur ever appears. That's all you ever find out about her. Wow. Okay, so uh, now uh, some other important details. They might not seem it now, but turn to the right and go through Leviticus to the book of Numbers. Let's have a look at Numbers chapter 14. Another little detail, just a little detail here. But look at the first sentence of 14, verse 25. 14, verse 25. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Ah, these are valley-dwelling people. And the Rephidim was a valley place. So they're in the valley. So, huh, they're valley dwellers, and they're attacking, and Moses goes up on a hill you know, some high point of land. So their valley types, I don't know what to call them, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but they're of the valley. Okay, so that's an important little detail. Look at Numbers 24. There's an interesting little story here that some of you may remember where Balaam is sort of hired to curse the children of Israel, and he just absolutely can't do it. He tries a bunch of times and says the most beautiful prophecies of all the great things that are come up. So let's have a look, read some of these just because they're beautiful. Let's start in verse 15 in Numbers 24 and we'll read down to verse 20. So he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam the son of Beor and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened. And he was a person from the east somewhere and he, I think he was from Syria or something, but uh, as I say, hired to curse the children of Israel by an enemy of the children of Israel. And here's what he says. The utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. Yes, goes, goes into a vision, his eyes are open, but he's, but he's fallen down. And, uh, and this is what he says. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of tumult. Yes, and people understand this to be a prophecy of the Messiah, of Jesus who's going to come at a future time. This star is going to come out of Jacob. And, uh, and um, Jesus was descended, you know, not by blood, but, but his sort of adopted father, Joseph, was, was of that lineage. Go on. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also, his enemies, shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Yes, so this is the prophecy about 
out of Jacob there will come this mighty leader, this powerful person, this Messiah figure. And look at what he does. I forgot he did this. Look at what he does. Just throws it in for free. Then he looked on Amalek, he being Balaam. Balaam. Then he looked on Amalek, and he took up his oracle and said... Now, he wasn't hired to say anything about Amalek. You're just supposed to talk about the children of Israel, but he bothers, oh, there's Amalek. Let me tell you something about them. What did he say? Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Then I see. Okay, that's it. And then he looks over at the Kenites and says some other things. And so, so it's just interesting that he, in the midst of this prophecy about the Lord coming and this amazing thing that's going to happen, he says, he calls the Amalekites the first. First of the nations, is that what it says? First among the nations. First among the nations, but he's going to perish forever. So there's sort of a theme. that The Malachite, they may be tough, but they're going to get wiped out eventually. And uh, turn to the right and go to Deuteronomy, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Good fun. And listen to this little detail that we hadn't heard before. It's an interesting little detail that the text has not told us about anywhere in it, you know, from Genesis right up to here. Look at verses 17 to 19. Uh, who is saying this? Is, this? is this the Lord speaking through Moses or something like that? Seems like Go it. Go on. I think so. Commandments yeah. Commandments of some sort. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Ah, see, you don't get that detail before. You just hear about them battling in the valley. But here you learn that the Amalekites who live in the valley come sneaking up. Isn't it bound to be the case, even if you <laughs> take a tour of 28 people around a foreign country or something like that, there's just stragglers, you know, they're just our people who sort of are a little late to catch up with the rest of the group or whatever. So if you have what's estimated to be two million people out in the wilderness, there's going to be a few stragglers, a few sick people who are not moving as quickly. And the Amalekites, this is part of what was sort of nasty and creepy about them, was they attacked the people who were sick and you know, elderly and faint and weary and so on. And they pick off the, pe the people at the back of the, back of the group. Go on. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Yes, don't forget, you've got to wipe, very important to wipe these people out. Now, it's interesting in that particular passage, because the theme of wiping out the Amalekites has been in a number of these passages we've been reading. But in some of them, the Lord says, I'm going to wipe out the Amalekites. But this one says, you're going to wipe out. Like, don't forget, you're supposed to wipe out the Amalekites. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, all right, there are, there are three more scriptures that I want to read before I sort of dig into some analysis here, if that's good with you. Let's go to the New Testament, if you will, to the right, and let's go to the Gospel of Matthew, the first of the Gospels there, Matthew chapter 10. And uh, this just came to mind in this connection tonight. Look at verses 34 to 39. This is Jesus speaking. What does he say? Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. There have been a lot of swords tonight. The edge of the sword, the sword, the sword, and all that stuff. And the Lord says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay, go on. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Here it is. Drum roll. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Ah, those Amalekites. Your worst enemy is your relatives, you know? <laughs> Don't you find that's true, friends? <laughs> distant. They might be distant relatives. But isn't it true that our, our foes of those are your own household? Go on. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And then one more little thought he puts in there. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Yes, that's right. So uh, the Lord comes to bring a sword and that people will be, relatives will be at variance with each other and so on. And that you need to love the Lord above all kind of thing. And we need to take up our cross and follow the Lord or we're not worthy of him. And uh, turn to the right and go through the rest of the four Gospels and Acts. And I want you to go into Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans. We go to chapter 8. Uh, let's start at 8 verse 35. And I think we might as well read to the end of the chapter there in 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Or the sword, yep. Always makes the list, yep. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. Now, I don't much love that scripture. For your sake we are killed all day long. Go on. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. I don't like that. It's not my favorite passage. But look at the next verse that comes immediately after that. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Huh. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's a weird, weird juxtaposition. You've got to admit, right? The juxtaposition of being killed, not just once, but all day long, right? It's pretty extreme. We're killed for your sake. We're killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then Paul explains a little more in the last two verses. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, and I like that preposition, which is in Christ, like the love of God is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the, that's the vehicle, that's the vessel from which we get that love. So, yes, we go through tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. We're killed all day long, counted as sheep for the slaughter, but none of these things are going to be able to separate us from the Lord, from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay, hold that in your mind. And one more scripture, just one more, friends, all the way back to the book of Revelation. It does tickle me how often, you know, we go from what we've been to Genesis to, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, the book of Revelation, uh, John on the Isle of Patmos has these visions of the spiritual world and these things may not seem related, but I'm hoping I can sort of weave them together for you tonight. Uh, look at 6, Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, where John sees these seals being opened on this book. And what is the first thing that he sees? Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. And I want you to remember that bow. So the one who's sitting on the, he sees a white horse, and the one who's sitting, there's a rider on the, on the white horse, and he has a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now there's another white horse in Revelation 19, but Swedenborg's interpretation of this is very interesting, that he says that this is not... The Lord, like in Revelation 19, there's a white horse and the one who's sitting on him, his name is Lord of Lords and King of Kings or something like that. And he's also called the Word of God and so on. This is, this is someone else. Uh, this is someone sitting on this white horse and he has a bow and he's given a crown. And why do you think it repeats that word? What does it say about conquering? He went out conquering and to conquer. Conquering and to conquer, which kind of sounds a little bit like the conquering is now. 
and then to conquer is in the future or something. Like they'll, they'll be conquering now, they'll be conquering in the future. And so the fact that we're talking about how to conquer evil, and we just read in Romans about we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Um, uh, what is that image of the one who sits on the white horse and the one who has a bow? Well, let me see what I can, what I can do with this. Okay. I love this image because to me it's a picture of the ingredients that you need. Like, for instance, one of the age-old questions all through the history of Christianity, one of the long-standing questions has been, did Jesus do it for us or do we have to do it ourselves? Did Jesus do it for us or do we have to do, you know, is there any, do we just believe in Jesus or do we have to change our ways? Why would it tell us to repent if we didn't have to change our ways? But why would it say that, you know, the Lord came into the world to, to save us and to save his people from their sins and all, you know, why would it say that? This story answers that question to me. You need both. You need Joshua fighting in the valley for everything, with everything he's got. And you need Moses up on the hill, and you don't only need Moses up on the hill, but he's got to figure out some way to keep his arms up and keep, keep that rod in the air. You need both. It, the battle wouldn't work if Moses was just standing up there with the rod and nobody's fighting. In the, you know, that doesn't work. You can't just have just, Mo, just Moses does it with, with his rod and nobody's doing anything. But you'll notice that even though I'm sure that Joshua and the best people that he selected to be down there fighting out of this huge crowd, of, you know, millions of people, he picks the best fighters and they're down there in the valley fighting. Nevertheless, when Moses, it's not just when Moses is on the hill or not, but when his hands are in the wrong position, they for some reason can't win. They're just beaten back. And when, and when Moses' hands are up, oh, now they're, now they're winning. Weird, isn't it? It's a weird, st like, but jo why would that affect Joshua? Why would it make a difference to Joshua what Moses' hands are doing? It's because it's a picture of how we deal with evil. Uh, now, why would I say that Amalek means evil? Well, I would say that for two reasons. One is because Swedenborg says that what, that's what they mean. He says they particularly mean uh, th these falsities, these bad teachings from interior evil. These are particularly bad, you know. And uh, I want to tell you something a little bit about the children of Israel. They have been slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. And slaves have to work very hard. They have to do lots of work. One thing they don't do is carry a weapon. They don't, the Egyptians were terrified of them becoming a fighting force or joining their enemies. Uh, that's one reason they enslaved them. So uh, they, they had no exercise with weapon. They didn't know what they were doing uh, as a fighting force. This is the first time they ever fought the story of the Amalekites. Amalekites came sneaking up and picking off the, the, the stragglers at the back. And it's, no, we've got to confront this head on because uh, these valley sneaky Amalekites are coming in. So two reasons I think they're evil. One is Swedenborg says that, and the other is they're evil. I mean, you can tell. Right? They're bad. They, they just sneak and they attack. And aren't they just like, have you ever experienced that? Like they're not the sort of um, straight up, I don't know. You know, some people would get together and sort of fight like gentlemen or something, you know what I mean? Get in your battle lines or something. But this is just sneaky little desert, you know, picking people off at the back. And, and um, uh, so they're, they're bad. And you can tell they're bad because the Lord keeps saying, hey, I'm going to wipe them out, but I'm going to have to fight them from generation to generation to do it. And you're going to have to fight against them and you're going to have to wipe them out. And I haven't gone into the history here, but uh, there's a time when King Saul is asked to go fight them and wipe them out. And you may remember that he takes all their good flocks, spares the king, and takes a whole lot of, you know, I mean, he, he kills a bunch of the people, but he keeps a lot of the best stuff and the king alive. So he utterly fails to destroy the Amalekites, even though he's been told to do that so clearly. You gotta do this. He doesn't do it. They, they don't do it. Um, 
So, okay, what else? All right, what do these different elements mean? The hill has to do with our higher self. There are different levels within us. Where are the Amalekites? They are people of the valley. They're down here. They're down on that lowest level. And how there's certain kinds of hells that attack us using the outermost things of our life. You know what I mean? Just just your sort of sensory appetites and, and the, the most basic external things in our lives, that's where they come at you. They're not going to tackle you up on a mountain somewhere or something. They just sneak through the valley, get you in that lowest part of your life. When you're tired and worn out and the parts of you that are weakest, they just come attack the little weak, little picket off at the, at the back, you know? And so uh, that's what they do. And they're even sort of like the children of Israel because they're distantly related, but they're this different line that came down. Um, uh, so uh, who else do we have in this situation? So we have Moses. Moses means uh, it has to do with drawing out, like he was taken out of the water, and then he's going to lead the people out of the of the land of Egypt. So he has to do with drawing out. And Swedenborg says that he means, uh, he often means the word, he means divine truth. Um, uh, a point about his rod is the rod of God. Now, we might be tempted to think of this as a magic wand or something. But a magic wand would not fail when you have your elbow in the wrong position, you know? It's not a magic wand. Where Moses, what he's doing is an important part of the puzzle. And it's also not, a, he, you know, if it's a magic wand, you stand up on the hill and just zap everybody. But that's not how it works. Joshua has to pick the best men. They have to go down. They coordinate, you know, to work this whole thing out. All right. Uh, so um, what does Aaron mean? Swedenborg talks quite a lot about Aaron. Aaron's word in Hebrew means enlightenment. It means illumination. And Swedenborg talks about this thing, and it might be a little hard to set this up, but I think, I think I can do it. You see, Moses has something to do with the word. You can tell because he wrote those first five books of the word. The Ten Commandments were given, you know, like he was involved in all that. He has something to do with the, with the Bible, with the word. And... Um, Aaron is illumination. He's enlightenment. Aaron, says Swedenborg, means a body of teaching, or what some of the older translations of Swedenborg would re just simply refer to as doctrine. But it doesn't just mean sort of one teaching or something. It's a whole body of teaching. Aaron means the fact that, so, okay, you have the word, which is Moses, but you could read and read in it, and maybe it makes no sense to you. You know, like God is angry in this passage, but he's merciful over here and he's supposed to be omnipresent, but then he walks over here or he leaves or, you know, like it doesn't make sense. So Moses by himself cannot make sense. You need the help of Aaron. Aaron is a body of teaching. I don't know if you've read Swedenborg's works, good friends, but he has a habit sometimes, does he not, of when he's discussing one verse, just for fun, he'll throw in 20, 30, 40, 50 other passages from the Bible all over the place. So if he's talking about, you know, what Aaron means, he'll take you through all these passages of Aaron. What, what is Aaron? What is a hill? You know, all these passages. That is Aaron. That's a body of teaching. That's pulling a bunch of things. It really... This should be called the Aaron Bible study or something, because that's what we're trying to do here. Try to bring together, okay, what did it say about the Amalekites here? They're in the valley. What did it say over here? They were the first of the nations, but they need to perish. What did it say over here? They were relatives. You know, put it all together. What does it say about conquering? So on and so forth. So Aaron has to do with a kind of illumination or enlightenment that comes from a particular type of study. And her, I'm really interested in this, Her's name in Hebrew means uh, noble and it means freedom. Freedom. 
really interested in this. So I don't know if I'm getting my point across, good friends, but the way I see this is that Moses is able for a while to carry this whole thing, and he's able to lift up his hands. The most important part of the story, obviously, is what Moses' hands are doing. And what Swedenborg says these mean, these he's very clear about, that your hands are really, where is the power of your mind? Because Moses is up on a hill. Where is the power of your mind focused? Are you looking up to God or you're looking down to things of this world, to things that have to do with the love of self, love of the world, and so on? Where, where is your focus? As long as your focus is up, you can conquer even the Amalekites, nasty desert warriors who are way better at this than you are. But if you're looking up to the Lord, you can conquer those guys. But if you're looking down, if you start to, oh no, it's all about this world. I'm suddenly reminded of um, Peter when he's walking on the water. Doesn't he look at the wind and the waves and he freaks out and he starts to sink in? You know, it's kind of similar, isn't it? That, that when Moses is looking down, it's like, oh no, and then the Malachites start to win. And so the power of his hands is like the power of the mind. Where, where's your concentration going? You're looking to the Lord because then the, it'll win down there. Now, I hadn't thought about it before this moment, but if you're Moses and you're up there, you want to look down. You want to see how the battle is going, right? I, I want to see, how are they doing? Interesting thing is whenever you're looking at how they're doing, oh, they're losing, you know? But if you're not looking at how they're doing, if you're looking to the Lord, oh, they're winning, you know? It's, uh, they do better when Moses is looking up, when he's lifting up his, his hand. That rod means the power of divine truth. That rod, which I hadn't understood before, is definitely clearly a, a walking stick. It's a staff or something that you lean on to walk. And that was what he was, he was holding up. And that has to do with the uh, divine power, the power of divine truth. And as long as that's facing in the right direction, uh, it's okay. But when that starts to become about this world and, and love of self and, you know, those kind of issues, uh, the Amalekites start to win because that's exactly what they prey on in us. And why do I think that, how does her fit into this? Because Aaron holds up one hand, her holds up the other. And as long as they're doing it, his hands are steady and they go all day till the setting of the sun, right? All day. They're able, they're able to do this whole thing. In scripture, a day is just any period of time. It can be thousands of years or something. It's just a complete. So if this is the story of our lives, it's about getting into a position that you can maintain for the rest of your life. It's about getting the support you need to keep in that battle to your last breath. You know, that's what the end of the day. So what do you need to be propped up? How do we conquer evil? How do we do that? So we've got Aaron, whose enlightenment that comes from a kind of study, putting different things together and saying, oh, wow, yeah, okay, it couldn't mean that. The Lord couldn't be angry. He's nothing but love. They couldn't be angry. Even though it says he's angry, I understand now. Aaron helps you up on the one side. Her is freedom, and I think how I read this in this situation uh, is that, and Swedenborg says something unhelpful about how it is a derivative truth from a derivative truth. Thank you so much. But uh, her, I think, means uh, freedom, like that independence. Uh, everybody's taught something when you're growing up, whether it's in a religious tradition or whatever. You're taught something about how to behave or some sort of a code or something, something, something. And Swedenborg hammers the idea that whatever tradition you were raised in, whatever you were brought up with, you really need to look at it for yourself. You need to have the freedom and the independence to look at this thing for yourself and see, does it make sense? Because if we're just blindly following some tradition, we may not be able to conquer that. You know what I mean? Religions get kind of dinged up over time. And, and there may be stuff in, in the religion that doesn't make sense or the way that you're understanding it doesn't make sense. And, and so it's not helping you fight that hell, it's not helping you look up to the Lord. You've got to have a certain freedom. Go up on the hill, you know, not down in the valley, up on the hill, have some freedom, independence, and some study and research and enlightenment to be able to support Moses. One little side note, as long as I'm baffling you, is that it occurred to me that 
because the nature of scriptural stories, the way I understand them, the way Swedenborg explains them, is that one little story like this can encapsulate the whole of human history, like everything is in there. I think in a way, something that this story can be about is that in the beginning, just spirituality, which is Moses, just spirituality by itself was strong enough to beat the hells down. You know, so in the most ancient church, in the earliest times, there was enough goodness, there was enough love that, that um, Moses could do it alone. But over time, his hands got heavy. He couldn't do it. And we know from Swedenborg's description of spiritual history that over time, uh, you needed something, you needed reinforcements. You needed a body of study. You need Aaron on one side. You need this nobility and freedom of her, this kind of independence to, to support you on the other side. To, the, the, over time, he needed props uh, to help him up. What is the stone that he sits on? Interesting that he's standing up and then he gets tired and they put a stone down underneath him. And that's an, another important part of winning. I think the stone, it, the, the story doesn't start out with a stone, but a stone comes in there. Uh, well, we just read about the Ten Commandments. Weren't they written on stone? Uh, wasn't it a practice in ancient times that they would set up pillars to be witnesses, to be a boundary? Here's the farthest boundary. This is where the land ends and begins. This is where my territory ends and begins. Uh, this is where your territory starts. So I think of the stones. Stones are very sort of inert and long lasting. And, and so it's like that outermost kind of really basic truth. And Moses just sits on it. Just sit on that truth. Sitting spiritually has to do with like, I'm not moving, you know? And so Moses sits on these really fundamental, so that spiritual thing that used to be maybe standing up is now sitting on these really basic principles. I don't know if I can articulate what this means to me, but uh, isn't it so important to have like really basic rules, like no matter how bad the argument's gonna get, you know, you're not gonna shoot the other person or something, you know, you've got some base thou shalt not kill or something. You've got some basic stone that you can sit on to say, well, I'm not, you know. And it also helps in your interpretation. Like in other words, if you have as a stone to sit on that the Lord is love, it's impossible for him even to frown at anyone ever. You're not going to fall prey to certain sort of readings or misunderstandings or something. You're just going to be clear. You know, you're going to have that clarity. So this threesome, these three people up there and the rod and the stone is what we need on the spiritual level. So let's talk about what's going on in the valley. What is going on in the valley? Moses sent someone into the valley. Who was that, dear reader? He sent someone down in the valley, said, pick out people. Joshua. That was Joshua, wasn't it? And dear reader, do you know what the name Joshua means? I think it means savior. Like yes, Jesus. yes, Lord. it's like jaw saves, right. It is the same name as Jesus. Oh, isn't that interesting? Huh, Jesus is down in the valley leading the fighting. Wow, that's really interesting. So you got this spiritual thing up here and it's held up by this understanding and everything, but luckily Jesus is doing the fighting for you. And who is he fighting with? Oh, the parts of you that he picked out. Well, here's a truth I can use. Here's, here's something I can use. Yeah, okay, we can use this. We can use that. That's your fighting force. Now, it's amazing that even that, if you don't have the spiritual part right, even that doesn't help you. You know, this is what's so fascinating about it to me. But I'm sure that part of what this means is that we absolutely have to, as if of ourselves, as Swedenborg says, get out in that valley and fight like we are the children of Israel, you know, and we've got to get out there. Uh, we have to have some skin in the game. We have to be trying as hard as we possibly can. So a theory that Moses is going to go up on the hill and fix it for you and you don't have to pick up your weapon. Luckily, Jesus did everything for you. Doesn't really wash in this story, you know, 
even if Jesus is down there at the front of the fighting and telling you what to do, you still got to be in there with your sword swinging away, right? You've got to be doing something, trying your hardest, even though what's happening during the course of the battle is that sometimes you're losing, sometimes you're winning, and you can't figure out why. I don't know if that fits with your experience, good friends. <laughs> it certainly fits with my experience, you know? And uh, part of what I think is going on here is so important for us to realize this whole story is getting to a really core, deep, sort of mysterious kind of truth, I think, that it is utterly necessary for us. It gets to the first two teachings I mentioned. That Swedenborg says, can you deal with evil or not? Yes and no. You know, uh, of ourselves, if it's just us, if we got up in the morning and got a stick and a club and went out there in the valley, we would lose to the Amalekites. We just absolutely would. We, we can't, can't deal with them. Even if Moses is up on the hill, we'd still lose unless <laughs> all these things are in place. Um, but Moses can't do it alone. We've got to be out there fighting. So I, I just love the clarity of that. I love that image. And so you win some, you lose some. Part of the story is that you know, Moses' hands get tired and sometimes they're, they're you know, lagging and so forth. And uh, then, you're, then you're losing. Uh, that's part of the process because we learn a lot when the Amalekites are winning. You know, we learn humility. We realize, oh, I guess really the Lord is the one doing the fighting here and all that. And then when uh, those tools that are needed in the spiritual self are there, and they are mainly about an acknowledgement. Uh, Swedenborg talks about this quite a lot, that we absolutely need to live our lives as if it's 100% up to us. If we find, if there's some evil that we're battling, if we find ourselves in some battle with evil, we have got to pull out all the stops and do whatever we can to fight that thing. Make a plan, strategize, figure it out, try to study what it is, you know, make a, make a plan of battle, a plan, plan of attack and everything. Uh, we've got to do that. And yet, inwardly, if, we, if our inner Moses is not looking up to the Lord, if we are not, which is an acknowledgement, if we're not acknowledging that all the power to conduct this fight comes from the Lord and from the Lord alone, he's the only one who has the power to fight this. He's just humoring us by giving us some rubber sword to stand beside him and pretend we're fighting, you know. Uh, but it's important. He wants to work it in us, like have that experience. Okay, good. Good, good job, guy. Good, you, you got him. Good. You know, he wants us to have that feeling of fighting it. He wants us to be clear that we know that that's evil and we're fighting it, even though we're useless by ourselves. So when the acknowledgement of the Lord is there and fighting our hearts out, that's how you conquer evil. And uh, it doesn't get eradicated, you know, it doesn't, all through the history of the Old Testament, the Amalekites never get wiped out. It doesn't, it doesn't actually get wiped out. But it does get uh, dealt with and conquered, like they're no longer a problem. You know, you know how to deal with them. And, uh, and so that's, that's really, really important. And um, hmm. so um, when it says that there was a white horse, a white horse, as it turns out, means an understanding of the word. Swedenborg says that horses in scripture mean the way that we understand word, the, the word. He even says in the spiritual world, when you see people talking about the word with a good understanding, you see a white horse, because it means a pure, a true understanding of Scripture. So this is the same story in a way. And the one sitting on the horse is not the Lord, it's us. We are going forth. And what is that bow that you're carrying? What does a bow mean in Swedenborg's Correspondences? It means doctrine. It means the same thing Aaron means. Wow, the bow is the same thing as Aaron. And I think what that image is, is that that body of teaching 
helps you really get you know, focused in the way that you're reading scripture. Like, oh, I see that you know, right there. I can see that's what that bow is. It gives you a lot of power to fight against evil and falsity because you've got clarity. If you don't have that clarity, if you don't, I have no idea, I don't know what scripture means. I don't know, it's all a mess to me. You know, it's going to be hard to fight those particularly deep, inner, sneaky evils. They're, they're, hard, they're hard ones. You could fight some easy ones, but the hard ones, you're really going to have to have some clarity. So that bow, and what Swedenborg says about the conquering is really beautiful. I alluded it to it earlier already, I think, that they, 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 he goes forth, and what does he have? A crown. He's got a crown. And Swedenborg says, that's a badge of the victory. Victory is possible, my friends. From the Lord, victory is possible. And it says, he goes forth conquering and to conquer. And Swedenborg says, this means the whole picture of, of this rider on the white horse is a picture of someone who has survived a temptation. I don't know if you remember that at the beginning of this evening, we were talking about how the children of Israel had just won this major thing where they got away from the Egyptians. The Egyptians were all dead. And then they went three days into the wilderness and instead of sacrificing to God, they all got thirsty and complained. And then they all got hungry and complained. And then they got thirsty and complained. And then the fourth thing was happened was they got attacked by the Amalekites. <laughs> And so this is a picture of temptation. You're moving forward in your spiritual life, but trials and difficulties come up that are meant by, the, first of all, the thirsty is you don't have enough truth, and then the hunger is I don't have enough love. And then, you, and then once you get the love, then you don't have enough truth. And then when you get those things, now you're ready for the Amalekites. This goes to the next level in the video game. Now you've got to fight the Amalekites. And um, these, these ones of the valley that come sneaking up on you, uh, from behind. Now, now you're ready uh, to deal with those. Uh, the rider on the white horse is said to be riding forth conquering and to conquer because Swedenborg says that if in this world you, through following the kind of thing that we've been talking about, acknowledging and looking to the Lord inwardly as much as you can, you won't be able to do it 24-7, but as you're able, looking to the Lord then under those circumstances, Joshua, you know, the Lord sort of boots on the ground, can lead you to victory. When the work's being done, he's the one doing it. He can lead you to conquer. And if you conquer in temptations, in a battle with hell, in this world, you have conquered them forever. That's what conquering and to conquer means when you have a correct understanding, a true understanding of truth, how it's all about love and everything, uh, then you can fight these hells and the Lord can conquer them for you and they can be dealt with permanently. I'm not standing up here saying that this is evil. I lose these battles for a living. Um, but uh, I like having sort of a recipe of how to do it. Sometimes all you do is just fail a little more slowly than you did the last time. <laughs> you know what I mean? You fall a little more slowly or something. Uh, but it's so good to feel, it's so useful to feel the power of that hell coming at you and realizing, man, Swedenborg has this great riff. I wish I could quote it for you. Something like, we have no more power against hell than a flea against an elephant or a gnat against a mountain that's falling on it. You know, uh, that's the nature of the battle that we're up against. It's very, very humbling. But uh, when you realize, oh, but the Lord is willing to conquer for us, it, we just got to look to him. Lift our eyes. No, no, stop looking down the valley. Look up. Hold up that rod of, of that divine truth, that very practical walking stick kind of truth that needs to be there. Have a good understanding from a bunch of passages, a good lamp of doctrine in your mind, and that freedom and nobility to be able to really examine it for yourself and see, are the things that I've been taught, are they really true? Do they hold water? Do they work in the field? Those three things, that spiritual thing and those other two up there, sitting on that rock, or that really bedrock truth, and then Joshua's down in the valley. I don't know if I've succeeded tonight, friends, but I've hoped to give you some picture of how it works. I think this is the nature of biblical stories. One little story, just a few little verses. Oh, this happened, went back and forth, and then, oh, 
and then they won. You know, but there's a whole story in there about how the Lord can lead us out of hell, how He can help us, even though it might not feel comfortable. We might even be tempted with Paul to say, you know, we're dying all day long or something. You know, the, 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 uh, but nevertheless, we are more than conquerors through Him who who loved us. Let's go. Thank you, good friends. Uh, let's close with a prayer, shall we? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the one God of heaven and earth. You bowed the heavens and came down into this world. This was your story, Lord. You were able to conquer the hells in a way that we are not, and you're able to bring that power to us in our battle with the hells. Please help us to remember, Lord, to look to you inwardly and then to strap on our armor and fight as best we can. We realize that we will fail sometimes, Lord, but we want to make this effort in your name and keep looking to you so that you may conquer these evils for us, knowing that once you have conquered them, they are conquered for us forever. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting, friends, so that we can win one day. <laughs>